Um, all right, so now I will I'll move forward and I'll introduce Chris Hauser. Um, he's going to talk to us about strengthening our connection to nature. Um, Chris is the director of science for the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska, where he conducts research and evaluates prairie management and restoration work. He's also dedicated to raising awareness about the value of prairies through his photography, writing, and presentations. Chris is the author of um, the Prairie Ecologist blog, blog, and he's also written two books. Um, first is The Ecology and Management of Prairies in the Central United States, and then Hidden Prairie, Photographing Life in One Square Meter. He's also a frequent contributor to Nebraska Land Magazine and other publications. And Chris and his family live in Aurora, Nebraska. So, Chris, if you are ready, you can go ahead. I'm ready if you are. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm actually talking to you from the Nature Conservancy's Niobrara Valley Preserve. I'm looking out the window right now um, at part of 56,000 acres that we own here along the Niobrara River. We're at the north edge of the Nebraska Sandhills. We have about a thousand bison on the place. Um, and it's just a, a spectacular place. And I had to come here for a meeting, gosh darn it. Um, and, and I'm actually gonna give this presentation and I'm gonna drive three and a half hours to get back home tonight. But I wanna start out um, first by correcting my grammar. And, and then, I'm not, then I'm gonna talk about sunflowers. And the reason I wanna talk about sunflowers is that it's a really good starting place to talk about ecological resilience. And I'm gonna get into the role that people play in ecological resilience and more, important, uh, and more importantly, just conservation in general. So in Nebraska, I don't know what it's like in Ohio, but I assume it's similar. In Nebraska, we have nine species of sunflowers that are, that are native to the state. Uh, two of those are annuals, seven of those are perennials, but we have nine different species. And there are a lot of species that depend upon those sunflowers. So for example, here's a longhorn bee. This is a solitary bee, um, meaning that it, it's just a single female with a nest. There's not a queen or workers or anything like that. But this species depends on sunflowers. It's the only kind of flower that they can gather pollen and nectar from to feed their babies with and to feed themselves with. So sunflowers are critical to survival of this particular bee. But sunflowers are also very generous with their pollen and nectar resources. They literally put it out on a platter to make it really easy for anything else to get. So there's a lot of species like this little tree cricket or uh, grasshoppers or lots of other things besides just pollinators that we think of that feed on the resources of these sunflowers while they're blooming. It's a really important resource. And because of that, there are predators like this little crab spider that can sit on sunflowers knowing that there's going to be lots of insects coming to get those resources and the predators can take advantage of that. Just like, you know, a crocodile in an African watering hole. Uh, they know they just have to sit there because somebody's going to have to come to get that water. And then outside the flowers, sunflowers produce a lot of vegetation and there are species like this plains lubber uh, grasshopper. This is a mouse sized grasshopper. It's a big old grasshopper, flightless grasshopper. And it doesn't feed on grass. It feeds on wildflower uh, vegetation and especially sunflowers. Sunflowers are the favorite plant of the plains lubber grasshopper. Um, the seeds of sunflowers are really nutritious and big. It's why if you're, if you're a bird uh, feeder and you have a feeder in your yard, you probably use sunflowers. Or maybe you don't use sunflowers because they're so attractive that things like squirrels will come and use them. Um, but there, there's a reason for that. They have a lot of nutrition packed into a tight little container. And so they're really attractive to lots of animals as a food source. And then bigger animals like this little bison uh, or cattle also eat a lot of sunflowers at different times of years. They can be really important food sources for these really large animals. So I say all that because Sunflowers are an example of a group of plants that provide a lot to the landscape. And this is a picture of the Niobrara Valley Preserve where I'm sitting right now. In 2012, after a 70, 70 some thousand acre wildfire swept through the area and burned half of our preserve, so about 35,000 acres, so more than half, I guess, um, 
including a lot of uh, one of our big bison pastures, which is shown here, in the middle of a huge drought in the summer. So this is a late July wildfire. And really it was the drought more than the fire that stressed the plant community in this prairie. But a year later, a year following this big event, this is what that same area looked like. So annual sunflowers mostly and some perennials, but mostly annual sunflowers sort of took over this landscape after that big stress because a lot of the other plants weren't able to recover as strongly or, or as quickly after the drought. And sunflowers were like, okay, I can take it from here. And they exploded onto the scene and provided all those resources we just talked about during a time when a lot of other plants were not able to provide much. So it's a really, it's a, it's a key, key response that nature has to stress. And we can create that same response through our management. So for example, this is a part of our bison pasture that was burned in the springtime by us. We did a prescribed fire. And then the bison came and grazed that part of their big pasture. This is a 10,000 acre pasture. They came and grazed the burned area really intensively all summer. And so by the time I took this picture in June, the most of the grass was being grazed very close to the ground. There's a lot of bare ground because of the fire and the grazing combination. So there were a lot of plants that were being stressed out by that bison grazing, which is a perfectly normal part of prairie management and prairie ecology. And the response to that a month later was similar to what we saw after that wildfire. So sunflowers, again, sort of stepped up, filled in the gap that was provided because of the fire and grazing. So sunflowers can do a lot. It's just one example. But the reason that it's neat and, and important is that there are nine different species of sunflowers and each of them responds in different ways to different scenarios. But it also means that anywhere you go in our state of Nebraska, you're gonna find a sunflower of some kind. If you go up on a hilltop, there's certain si kinds of sunflowers. If you go down in the bottoms, there's a different kind of sunflower. There are sunflowers that do well under trees. There are sunflowers that do better out in the open. So every habitat has its own kind of sunflower which is important for a couple of reasons. One, anything that relies on sunflowers will be able to find it uh, wherever it goes and wherever it lives. But it also means that as the climate continues to change and then these communities continue to shift, these sunflowers will be able to shift around and hopefully 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we'll still have a sunflower in every habitat, although we might see different species in different places. Okay, I wanna talk about milkweed for a minute. This is what most people think of when they think of milkweed, right? Big pink flowered plants. In Nebraska, at least, we have 17 different kinds of milkweed. I'm sure it's similar in Ohio. They come in all different shapes and colors and sizes. And milkweed are really important for pollinators like this regal fritillary butterfly, for example. Also wasps are big fans of milkweed. If you're not familiar with wasps, by the way, I mean, you're familiar with wasps, but most people don't know that wasps as adults are nectar feeders. They are, that's what they eat. They just eat nectar. They feed their kids meat, right? So they, they paralyze or kill prey to feed through their babies. But as adults, they're, they're pollinators, they're nectar feeders. And milkweed is a very popular group of plants for wasps. And then there's a bunch of these specialist insects that rely on milkweed as a food source, and they've sort of figured out how to deal with the toxic white latex, that sticky white stuff inside milkweed leaves. So things like this longhorn milkweed beetle or this milkweed bug, which by the way is a migratory species. These bugs migrate long distances seasonally, uh, which doesn't seem possible for a little tiny bug like this. And there's a whole range of other species that are that are, have adapted to the toxic nature of milkweed species and that rely on milkweed. If there weren't any milkweed, these species wouldn't exist. And of course, the most famous of those invertebrates is the monarch butterfly caterpillar, right? So monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed, caterpillars feed on the milkweed. And importantly, those caterpillars can feed on all the different kinds of milkweed that we have. So they have 17 in Nebraska, they have 17 different options to feed on. And the reason that's important was demonstrated back in 2017 here in Nebraska. So monarch butterflies, you know, everyone knows are migratory species, right? They, in the Eastern population migrates from the U.S. down into Mexico during the winter. And the way it works is the, the, the adults that leave the U.S., so like, for example, here in Nebraska, we have adults that leave Nebraska in the fall, they fly to Mexico, they stay over winter in Mexico, and then those same individuals fly back up into the U.S. 
and they get about as far as Oklahoma or Arkansas, usually most years, and they lay eggs. On milkweed, those eggs hatch, become, become caterpillars, which become adults, and then those adults fly to Nebraska. So normally by the time they get to us, it's about right now. We're just starting to see our first monarchs here in Nebraska the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's in May, and then they lay eggs and they start generations that live in Nebraska for the summer. In 2017, though, something weird happened with the weather. And we got a lot of monarchs that moved straight from Mexico all the way up into Nebraska in April. And Nebraska in April doesn't have a whole lot yet for flowers because it's still cold. And so we saw a lot of monarchs, for example, feeding on dandelions like this one. And you can see how faded this monarch is because it has had a hard life. It's flown to Mexico and back. So pollen and nectar sources were really important. But the other thing that happened was they were looking to lay eggs on common milkweed, which is their favorite plant in most years. But we had just had a hard freeze right before the monarchs showed up. So the milkweed plants had mostly frozen off. They weren't available and these monarchs were desperate to lay eggs. The reason that that milkweed diversity is important comes to play now because there's a species called world milkweed, which has these skinny little leaves and is much less prone to frost and freezing. And world milkweed was in great shape. It looks nice and green and vibrant. And so even though it's not normally the favorite plant of monarchs to lay eggs on, monarchs laid eggs on world milkweed because that was the, the thing that was available. And here in this picture, you can see both an egg and a caterpillar of a monarch on world milkweed. And the fact that we had a diversity of milkweed species came into play and allowed monarchs to raise that generation in a weird year. And it made sure that we had monarchs around for the rest of the summer so that there were some to, still, to go back to Mexico. And the only reason that happened was that we had a, a variety of different milkweed species, which each have different ways of surviving, including being less or more prone to freezing. I'm going to give you one example more of the importance of diversity and redundancy. And it's going to talk about bees, pollinators in general, but mostly bees. And I'm going to start with honeybees, which is what this is. And I want to start with honeybees very quickly so that I don't have to talk about them anymore. Honeybees are a species that uh, is what you learn about in school. If you learned about bees in school, you probably learned about honeybees. When most people think about or hear about the pollinator collapse or you know, the bee apocalypse or whatever it is, the collapse of bee, of bee populations, most people think about honeybees. And that's unfortunate because honeybees are really not in any danger of extinction in the US. Honeybees are a livestock species that we brought in from Europe uh, in the 1600s, along with crops that we brought from Europe. Um, and so they're not a native species. They are beneficial, of course, and they're amazingly uh, cool to study and to watch but they actually don't do a whole lot for a lot of native plant species because they're not adapted to those plant species or they're not as well adapted. And more importantly, they can compete with a lot of our native pollinators for the resources that are on those, on those uh, are coming from those plants. And the reason I say that they're not in danger of extinction is that honeybees are taken care of by people, right? We have beekeepers that manage their populations. If a, if a colony collapses and dies, a beekeeper can just order a new one from the mail, right? You can literally get bees in the mail and you can restart a colony. I'm not saying it's not expensive or painful for that beekeeper to do that, but the species itself is not in danger. However, there are lots of other bee species that are at risk, including bumblebees. And in Nebraska, we have about 20 different species of bumblebees. I'm sure it's again, similar in, in Ohio. More importantly, we have all these other little tiny bees mostly solitary species that come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. And again, in Nebraska, we have about 400 species of these. Uh, in the continent of North America, there's around 4,000 or 5,000 bee species. That's an amazing diversity of bees. And the majority of those are solitary bees, which are small, they're colorful, they come in different shapes and sizes and colors, just like I keep saying for all the plants we've talked about. But the point is there's a lot of diversity and each of them has its own strategy for survival. Most of them are solitary, which again means there's a single mom who raises a family in a hole in the ground or in a hole in a stem. And what she does is she spends her whole day collecting pollen and nectar, uh, bringing it back to the nest, taking it down into the hole, uh, packing it in a little pouch or a little, a little pile, laying an egg next to it, sealing it up in a cell. And then she stacks those cells of eggs and food on top of each other within the nest. 
That's her whole job. The males, all they do is hang around flowers hoping to find a female to mate with. That's their whole job in the world. But there's no support system for these bee species in terms of, you know, they're living on their own. There's no queen or workers to support the queen. It's just a single mom. And humans don't support them in terms of being able to save them if something happens, right? We can support them through habitat management, which I'm going to talk about. So here's an example of what a, a solitary bee nest often looks like. There's usually a little raised edge around the edge of a lot of these, these holes. And when the female is home, she'll sit at that hole and, at the edge of the hole and protect it from predators or parasites or things that might get down there to steal her eggs. But most of the time she's out collecting food. This is an example of a rare well, it's a rare example of a bee species that is a specialist, a real specialist on, on the plants. So earlier I talked about a sunflower bee that, that feeds mostly on sunflowers or exclusively on sunflowers, but even that, it can feed on multiple species of sunflowers. This is a species called the blue sage bee, which as far as we know, feeds only on one species of flower, which is blue sage or pitcher sage. And without that plant, you don't have the bee, right? And I love the fact that this cute little fuzzy bee has an eye that's the same color as the flower it feeds on. It's got that beautiful blue eye. But most bees are more generalist than that. They can feed on different species of plants, which means that during the season when they're out as adults, they rely on plant diversity because they have to have different flowers that, that bloom after one set of flowers stops, right? Now one, a particular flower species might open for a week or two or three, and then it, when it's done flowering, it, there's got to be other flowers to follow up on it. So plant diversity is really important for these bees. This little bee that I'm showing you here that's holding on to that uh, flower by its mouth is an example of what's called a cuckoo bee. And if you know anything about European cuckoos, uh, they're similar to brown-headed cowbirds here in the U.S., meaning that they are brood parasites or nest parasites. So they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Cuckoo bees do the same thing with bees. So this little cuckoo bee doesn't have a nest of its own. It goes down into the nest of a, of a different bee species when that female is out collecting food and it lays its eggs inside that nest. And when its eggs hatch, they eat the food that's been provided for the host bee instead of the host bee's larvae, which don't get any food at all. So it's not great for the host bee, but it's a really fascinating strategy for this little cuckoo bee. And there's lots of different cuckoo, cuckoo bee species out there that are important pollinators for us too. Okay, all that background on bees to say this. Plant diversity is really important for bees because there's gotta be that redundancy in the availability of lots of different kinds of flowers to keep these bees satisfied through the season. And in reverse, there's gotta be lots of different bee species to keep the flowers pollinated so they can produce seeds so that if one bee species has a tough year, there's lots of other bees that can fill the role. Just like if a flower species doesn't, doesn't bloom one year, there'll be other flowers blooming at the same time that can provide what the bees need. So if you have flower diversity and bee diversity, you probably have a pretty good healthy ecosystem. And it's one of the great things about all the energy and, and excitement about pollinators right now is that pollinators really are a pretty good weather vane for conservation. If pollinators are doing well, most other things probably are doing well too. And when we have a healthy system, what we're really talking about is ecological resilience. And I want to talk about what that means real quick, because it's different than the kind of resilience you might think of in other, in other senses. And this is where I'm going to get a little wonky science-wise, uh, but I promise it won't be too bad. So ecological resilience is basically the capacity of an ecosystem or a community, a natural community, to remain stable but when I talk about stability within an ecosystem, that doesn't mean that it looks the same all the time or that it doesn't never changes. What it means is there's a range of stability that it needs to stay within. So if you think about a prairie as a ball and that range of stability as a bowl, you've got a little ball that rolls around inside the bowl, right? And as disturbances like fire, in, for the, in the case of prairies, fire, grazing, drought, or all different kinds of stresses or disturbances that can push the ball around in the bowl, and it forces it to change and act in different ways. But as long as it stays within that regime, that, that stability range, or within that bowl, it's still a prairie. It still provides the same functions. It's got the same species. It's doing the same processes. It has that integrity of a prairie but we can push it too far, 
And if it gets pushed too far, it leaves that bowl and it enters a different bowl and becomes a different community type. And that threshold between those two bowls is super important because it's not really very likely to go back to where it was. It's almost impossible to go backwards once it's crossed that threshold. So here's a couple quick examples of that. One example is if we take a prairie and we turn it into a soybean field, that's pushing it out of the bowl. That's a really obvious example, right? And what we found is, not surprisingly, you can't just take a soybean field and stop farming it and expect it to go back to a prairie. It's changed fundamentally. It's not in that same bowl anymore. It can't go backwards. The same thing can happen with tree encroachment. So you can have a prairie with some trees in it, and that's a prairie with scattered trees. And for a while, you can sort of move in between like a prairie and a savanna type. But eventually, if you get too many trees, you move from a grassland with trees to a forest. And when you have a forest or a woodland, it's a different community type. You've got different species that are supported, plants and animals both. Uh, the soils just start to change. The, the nature of the soils themselves change. And so just cutting down the trees or removing the trees doesn't allow that prairie to come back the way it was before because a threshold has been crossed. There's a permanent shift or at least a mostly permanent shift. The trickiest example of all of this in terms of these thresholds is if you have a grassland that loses its species diversity through things like chronic overgrazing or broadcast herbicide use, something that, that removes a lot of the plant species from that prairie, at some point that also crosses a threshold, we think. And the reason we think that is we have sites like this in Nebraska that I've been managing for 25 or 30 years now, and that diversity just doesn't come back. Even though we do everything that normally enhances diversity of a site or sustains the diversity of a site, we just don't get those plants and animals to come back to this site. Something has fundamentally changed about that place. So there's less productivity, there's less function. It's in a new stable state. It's in a new bowl from what it was. So as land managers, as caretakers of these places, our job really is very simple, which is to keep the ball in the bowl. And we want to, the, the bowl represents the resilience of that site. And really, I wanted to show you this thing last, which is that it's not as simple as just a linear system, right? It's more like an egg carton than a bowl, if you want to think about it that way, because the ball could go in lots of different directions. Anyway, I put this in here because it took me a long time to make this stupid little graphic, and I just wanted to make sure you saw it. <laughs> okay, so ecological resilience is really important. And there's three things that really drive ecological resilience in prairies and woodlands, both. The first one is species diversity. And that's why I started talking about sunflowers and milkweeds and bees, because in all three of those examples, having lots of species that play similar roles to each other, but they're overlapping roles, that redundancy is really important. They can fill in for each other at different times and they can make sure that there's a consistent supply of food or resources or services to provided to the communities that they live in. Species diversity is absolutely essential for ecological resilience. But also, you have to have habitat size. So, and, and by when you have a large piece of habitat, you also have redundancy of habitat types. So for example, in this photo, you can see these little hills in the foreground. There are gonna be plant species that like to live on the south side of a hill, right? It's the drier, warmer side of the hill, the sun warms it up more, and there are plants that are adapted to that. If something happens on one hill and wipes out a species of, the, of that plant, there's other hills nearby that are likely to have the plant, same plant species because they've got the same habitat condition. And if you have a large patch of habitat, you're gonna have more of those examples of redundancy. And that means that that, that overall population at that site is probably not gonna blink out very easily because there's lots of, of different subpopulations that they can recolonize from wherever they're at. So habitat size is really important. Larger habitats have more sustainable populations of species. And if you can't have size, hopefully you can at least build connectivity, right? So even if you have scattered patches of habitat, but they're connected sometimes by a roadside habitat or a power line right away or something like that, there are ways sometimes for species to interact. It's not quite the same as habitat size, but it can still be helpful. And then from a strategic standpoint, resilience is, is promoted by protecting the habitats we have, Right? Let's not, let's not take habitats we have and make them smaller and more fragmented. 
restoring habitat where we can, so where we've lost habitat, if we can put a little bit of habitat back and restore connectivity or make patches a little bit bigger than they are now, that's really helpful for resilience. And then managing those habitats uh, that we have to make sure that species diversity stays high. And this is where people come in. And this is kind of the most important part of the presentation right here. And I want to challenge the idea that a lot of people have that nature is better off without people. You'll hear people talk about, um, you know, humans are an invasive species, or when can we just step away so that nature can take itself? Can we get these sites into good enough condition that we don't have to worry about managing them anymore, right? They'll just manage themselves. None of that really applies very well, I would argue, especially to grasslands, but even really to just about any ecosystem across the country or across the country and the world. And the reason for that is that for the last 20 to 30,000 years, most of the earth, most of the ecosystems on earth have been stewarded by people. They've been managed by people. And because of that, they've adapted to human management. And this is really important for a couple of reasons. So, and, and I'll give you an example with prairies in, in North America. Prairies in North America in the central part of the country have been around for about 10,000 years because that's about as long as it's been since the last ice age. So as the last glaciers receded to the north, the communities that, that came in, the plant communities that came in after those glaciers were shaped by people who had already been here for at least 10,000 years by that point. And a lot of those systems became prairies because of extensive and frequent use of fire by people. Right? And those people were using fire for lots of things. They were using it to attract bison, for example, for hunting, but they were also using it as, as a way to protect their village from wildfires. Sometimes they were attacking their neighbors with wildfires. Um, but they, and not, it wasn't just fire either, but they, they cultivated plants, they moved plants around the landscape, they hunted, which had a big impact on populations of different animals and their behaviors. All of those things were driven by people who were doing it very intentionally and, and thoughtfully. And one of the reasons that's important is that that's what ecosystems are adapted to now. The other reason it's important though is to acknowledge the impact of those people for that long period of time before now, right? The final reason that's important is we have an obligation now to continue that management because that's what ecosystems are adapted to and that's what they need to survive at this point. The resilience of landscapes today rely on people. And that's a statement that makes some people uncomfortable, but that's only if you sort of buy into this European model of wilderness, meaning of, of this, this sort of idea that, this, that nature is best off without people. And I just don't think that applies to at least the last you know, 10 to 20,000 or 30,000 years, which is long enough for a lot of evolution to happen and a lot of adaptation to happen. So what I would argue today is that we have an obligation as humans to, to facilitate resilience, to continue facilitating resilience on the landscapes where we are. That should be the purpose of conservation. And it's such a crucial thing to consider, or a perspective to have, that people in nature are connected in that way. And I'd love to have a conversation about that afterwards if people have questions or, or comments about that. So the tie between humans and nature is crucial. Unfortunately, right now, most humans don't think about it that way. And I, I think about this spectrum of where people are in terms of how they think about nature. And those of us who are interested in nature or uh, you know, work in conservation, either as volunteers or as professionals, I think we, we get used to the idea that people like nature because those are the people we hang out with. And we forget that the majority of people are not only not that interested in nature, but might be afraid of nature. I have a lot of people who I know who are very freaked out by a box elder bug on their windowsill. Um, and their first instinct is to be afraid of that. That's a really tough place to start having a conversation with somebody about conservation, right? We need to figure out where people are and help them move a little bit in our direction. If you start talking to somebody who's afraid of box elder bugs in their house about how cool 
rattlesnakes are and how important they are to an ecosystem, you're probably not going to get very far, right? We need to move them one notch instead of eight notches at a time. And let's get them to stop being afraid of bugs that aren't that aren't harmful. Uh, get them to pay attention to robins outside uh, on the street, right? Or uh, talk about uh, why bees are not something that they need to be afraid of if they see a bee on a flower. We just need to nudge them in the right direction. Once we get them further along, then we can start talking about things like spiders and snakes uh, and parasites and all those other fun things in nature. The other thing I think we do sometimes is we make the mistake of trying to convince people of the importance of conservation by focusing first on the utility part of, of nature, right? Clean water and carbon and food production, all those things, those are really important. And they are critical things that we should think about and their reasons for doing conservation. But I think if we lead with that, when we talk to somebody, a lot of times we turn them off. You don't usually start a conversation with somebody you've just met by spouting facts at them, right? When you meet somebody for the first time, the way you get to know someone, the way you build rapport is you share stories. Where are you from? Who do you know? And we find common ground by sharing stories with each other. And I would argue that if we're going to make common ground with people to build a larger constituency for conservation, we should do it through stories also. And so I'm going to hopefully convince everybody here that you are storytellers, that you can be storytellers, and that that's how we're going to grow our, our connection between people and nature and build a larger uh, conservation constituency. And storytelling can happen in a lot of different ways. You don't have to do it the way I do it with photos and writing and, and presentations like this. And you don't have to be an expert necessarily in, in anything. All you have to be an expert in is what you find fascinating about nature and conservation. And that can be anything, literally anything. So maybe you are a birder or somebody who likes to bird watch in your yard. You can tell stories about the birds that you've seen, what you've learned about birds, you could be somebody that's interested in insects or bison or seeds or anything. Whatever it is that draws you into nature and conservation is your passion. And you can talk about why that's interesting to you. And people will listen and be engaged with you in that because they're interested in what you're interested in. This is how humans connect with each other. So maybe your passion for nature has to do with recreation. Um, this, by the way, is a shameless plug for the Niobrara River, uh, which is right outside my window right now. Uh, it's National Scenic River in Nebraska. It's a great place to come kayak. But recreation is one way to do it. For me personally, the way I connect with nature and the way I try to connect other people with nature is by telling stories of what I see when I'm outside. And so, for example, I might talk about a spadefoot toad, which is more of a frog than a toad, but that's another story. But spadefoots in the Great Plains are mostly underground. And you usually only see spadefoots after a rain because uh, the rest of the time they're buried in the soil. And when it rains, they'll come out of the soil and they'll mate and they'll lay eggs in little puddles and then they go back underground again. And the way they go underground is basically they start digging with their rear feet and they just sort of over the course of a couple minutes disappear into the ground. It's like they just sort of sink into the earth. And it's fascinating to watch. It's a lot of fun to watch. I saw this, this was just a couple of summers ago. And over three minutes, this little spade foot went from being above ground to being in the soil and you wouldn't have known it was there. That's a really fun story. I might also tell, depending on the audience, I might also talk about hognose snakes. And if you're not familiar with hognose snake, the hognose snake is a completely harmless to, to human snake that feeds on toads, but when it's threatened, its first line of defense is to act like it's really dangerous. So it flattens its head and it looks like a viper and it coils up and it actually hisses by inflating and deflating its body and blowing air out in a really scary way. It's very uh, aggressive looking, but again, completely harmless. If that doesn't work, if that doesn't scare somebody off, its next line of defense is to flip itself over and pretend to be dead. So it flips over on its back, exposes its belly, it roils around on the ground like it's dying, and then it sort of stops and stares deadly at you, hoping that you're going to go away and leave it alone. And it just sort of stares at you until you do that. Um, 
And apparently this is really effective because there are a lot of hognose snakes that are still around today, but they're really cute little snakes. <laughs> On the flip side, another really fun story are, is about the sunflower tortoise beetle and the sunflower tortoise beetle larvae, which are shown here, feed on sunflowers. And those little club-like tails that you see there, that's poop. So <laughs> when the larva poops, it basically stores it on the end of its tail, and then it holds that over the top of its head as a way to protect itself from being eaten by things, because nobody wants to try to eat something that's got poop on top of it. And so it sort of just waves this smelly fecal matter above itself in the air as it eats as a way to protect itself. That's a pretty neat strategy. Speaking of uh, really neat strategies, this is an oil beetle. An oil beetle is, I just saw another one this well, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this one is feeding on a pasque flower, one of the first flowers that blooms in our prairies out here. Oil beetles, among other things, are fascinating because the, their larvae, the first larvae, when they hatch out of the eggs, are small and very active. You think about beetle larvae, and a lot of times beetle larvae are these slow-moving grubs, right? They're, they're the, the big juicy things that they eat in the Lion King um, and, and that are found under logs. But in the oil beetle, they actually have an extra set of larvae an earlier stage before they get into the bigger larvae that are very active. And what they do is after they hatch, they all gather together and they release a chemical into the air that is the same kind of chemical that a bee releases, that a female bee releases to attract males. So it's a pheromone that, that's used for female and male bees to hook up with each other. But the beetle larvae release this into the air and it attracts a male bee. The male bee comes down and lands on top of where the larvae are looking for this female that it just smelled. And all the larvae crawl up onto the bee. They don't do anything else. They just hitchhike on that male bee and the male bee flies away very confused. But eventually that male bee probably will find a female. And when it lands on the female to mate with it, all those little beetle larvae, the oil beetle larvae, crawl down off of the male bee and land on the female bee. And then they hold on to the female bee. And then they ride that female bee all the way back to her nest. And again, this is, these are solitary bees. So it's just a single mom with her nest. And unfortunately for that single mom bee, what happens next is as she goes down into her nest, all the beetle larvae crawl off and they go down into her nest and they feed on all the food that she's just provided for the larvae and often eat the larvae themselves. So just like a cuckoo bee, it's not a great thing for the regular bee or for the bee host, but it's a really fascinating way to live. And it's a neat story. Does anybody know what this is? I'll give you a different picture. Does that help? <laughs> That's what it looks like face to face. So I'll give you one more picture and some of you will recognize it now. This is a spittle bug, also known as a frog hopper. They look like a little leaf hopper. They're very tiny. But a spittle bug larva lives on plants and they feed on the juices within plants. But for some reason, uh, they protect themselves as they feed by basically uh, exuding these little bubbles out their rear end. So they pull in a lot of liquid, the liquid goes through them and out the other end and comes out in these big bubbles and they form these frothy masses that the larva can hide inside, which both helps them uh, to keep from drying out, but more importantly, protects them from predators who don't really wanna stick themselves into that weird mess of, of uh, goo to try to find something to eat. So you'll see these little masses all over the place. But if you ever see them, you can remember that this is what they actually look like face to face, these little frog hoppers. And then just again, these, these are examples of stories that I use to talk to people about conservation or to get them interested in nature. You'll have your own, but I would encourage you to think about, if you, if you forget everything else I talked tonight about, uh, remember this what, that I'm gonna talk about with flies, because I think this is fascinating. So here's a question. How many species of flies can you name? So everybody's gonna get house fly, right? Um, horse fly doesn't count because there's lots of horse flies. Deer fly doesn't count because there's several deer, deer fly species. Fruit flies, same thing, there's lots of fruit flies. 
So can anybody in the room there raise your hand if you know a species of fly other than housefly? I'm not seeing any hands. I, oh, there's one maybe, what you got? Hoverfly? Yes. There's, there's lots of hoverflies. So that's not a species, that's a group. Okay. This is what I, this is the great thing. So here's the fun thing about this. Now, how many species of flies do you think there are in North America? We can only name one, but there's got to be more than that, right? So how many species of flies? Just put a number in your head and then compare it to the real number. Hey, everybody. There are 61,000 species of flies in North America. 61,000. And most of us can name one or maybe a couple if we're really smart, right? That's astonishing. And that's a cool story to talk to people about. So here's a, house, here's a house fly. I'm kidding. That's not a house fly. It looks like a house fly. There's a lot of things that look like house flies, but that's not a house fly. This is definitely not a house fly. This is a kind of picture wing fly that looks like it's wearing a gas mask. Here's a horse fly, but it's only one of many kinds of horse flies. This one's almost an inch long or more. Dark black, gorgeous little fly. Uh, won't bite you, but it would bite you if you were a cow or a horse. Here's a tiny little fly with a white abdomen. I have no idea what species that is. Here's an even smaller fly. This is on Indian grass. If you're familiar with Indian grass, this is that gives you an idea of the scale of this little tiny fly, which is called a big-headed fly. Um, here's a crane fly that looks like a mosquito, but it's not. Um, it's actually, a, it, most crane flies adults, as adults don't even have mouth parts to feed with. They, as, as larvae, they feed underground on the roots of plants. Then as adults, they come out and mate and then die. But they look like great big mosquitoes. They're not because their legs are much longer. Uh, there's, a, there's some other differences, but they look like giant mosquitoes. But they're flies, as are, by the way, mosquitoes. So there's a couple of hundred species of mosquitoes in North America. All of them are flies. They're all within the same group that's called flies. Here's some hoverflies. So you talk about hoverflies. Here's some hoverflies. A lot of flies are pollinators and they feed on different kinds of flowers. Some of them look a lot like bees and they can be fuzzy and striped and colorful like a bee. Most of them have very short antenna, which is usually the easiest way to tell them apart. So this fly, you can see the tiny little antenna that looks like a kind of on their nose there. Um, a lot of these hoverflies feed on the pollen of grasses as well as wildflowers. Here's a kind of fruit fly that lays its eggs in thistles. So this is on a thistle. Uh, a lot of these flies will lay their eggs on a thistle head and then their larvae feed on the seeds of the developing thistle. This fly is a parasitoid. It's a uh, tachinid fly. And so this fly will lay its eggs on other animals, usually things like caterpillars or little insects of some kind. And then the egg will hatch and the little larva crawls off and burrows into the animal that, that it was laid on and eventually eats the inside of that animal until it dies, which is a sad thing for that animal, but a really important way to control populations of, of things like caterpillars or grasshoppers or things like that, to keep them from becoming out of balance or too abundant. Just like predators, these parasitoid flies are extremely important to a community of, of, in nature. And speaking of predators, there are a lot of flies that are predators, including this little cute thing that doesn't look like maybe it would be a predator, but it feeds on ants and other small creatures. It's called a long-legged fly. It's this iridescent, metallic, green-looking fly. And then my favorite predator fly, uh, there's a sentence you didn't expect to hear. My favorite predator fly is the robber fly. Here's one kind of robber fly. There's lots of different species, but robber flies are like surface to air missiles. Often they'll sit on a perch and they'll wait for a little insect to fly by nearby and they'll launch themselves into the air and intercept it into the air and either knock it out of the air or capture it and bring it back to a perch where they eat it. And when they eat it, this one has a little leaf hopper. They stick their little mouth part in and they inject a venom which both paralyzes and liquefies the inside of the, of the prey. And then they just sort of slurp the, the insides out and discard the husk. It's a very neat way to eat. Uh, it's much neater than most of us eat where we slop things all over the place. They just turn the inside into liquid and then they suck it out and get rid of the husk. And they can do that with pretty large prey sometimes. So here's a robber fly that took down a cicada that was, I don't know, four or five times its mass 
a huge insect. And I, this one knocked it out of the air and then had to search around for a chink in the armor to get its mouth part in there to do the job of, of paralyzing and liquefying, but it managed to get it done. This one took down a tiger beetle, which is in itself a predator. So there's a predator taking out another predator here. And then the, the best story, maybe these, these, a lot of robber flies are mimics. So this looks a lot like a bumblebee, but it's not. It's a robber fly. It's a mimic of a bumblebee, which is not a threat. Bumblebees are no threat to most other insects because they eat pollen and nectar and they feed their babies pollen and nectar. So this poor little beetle that's being ingested right now by this robber fly probably saw the robber fly ahead of time and thought, oh, that's no problem. That's just a bumblebee. And then that was the last thing it ever thought. And then I wanna end on the flies with these, this is called a bee fly. So we're back to pollinators again. It's got this long stiff proboscis and it can stick that little proboscis into a plant like a milkweed and suck the, the nectar out or get pollen through it too. So I wanna shift quickly to grasshoppers and then I'm almost done. We talked about the plains lover earlier. This is the mouse sized grasshopper I talked about that likes to eat sunflowers. Um, and it's example in Nebraska, we have 108 different species of grasshoppers. There's a huge diversity of grasshoppers. And again, back to resilience, flies, grasshoppers, all these things that have a lot of diversity, there's a real importance to that diversity. And some of these grasshoppers, I think grasshoppers tend to be thought of as these like green or brown grass munching machines, right? They just mow down vegetation. A lot of grasshoppers don't eat grass. They eat other kinds of plants. Some of them are specialists, some of them are not. A lot of them are flightless, like this one is another flightless grasshopper that's really colorful. And you might think, well, boy, that's not very well camouflaged. It's gonna get eaten by something. But remember things like leopards, right? Orange and black spots actually work really well in a dappled light environment where you have lots of vegetation with shadows and things. And, and this blends in really well when it's not just sitting there on bare sand. Speaking of camouflage, here's a grasshopper called the cudweed grasshopper which specializes on cudweed sagewort, which is this plant. And it's, a, it's the perfect match in color and texture for the plant that it likes best to eat. <clears throat> and then there are bandwing grasshoppers that live on bare ground most of the time or hang out. And they just blend perfectly into that environment until they start to fly, at which point they display these bright colored wings a lot of time. And they make this loud clacking sound, kind of cack, 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 as they fly off to startle a predator. And by the time the predator sort of recovers its senses, that grasshopper has landed on bare ground again and just sort of disappears back into the background. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully you, I've convinced you that grasshoppers are great, but if you don't like grasshoppers, I want to return you to this bee fly I talked about earlier, because bee flies, when they lay their eggs, will go around until they find a grasshopper that's also laying eggs. And grasshoppers, when they lay their eggs, they stick their rear end into the ground and they basically make a little tunnel and they insert eggs into the ground. When a bee fly finds a grasshopper doing that, the bee fly hovers above it and it flicks its own eggs onto the ground right next to where that grasshopper is. And when the bee fly eggs hatch, they crawl down into the hole and repeat the same story we keep hearing about tonight, where the bee fly or the yeah the bee fly larvae eat the food uh, or eat the uh, grasshopper eggs and larvae as their food. So they control, help control grasshopper populations, even though they're a pollinator most of the rest of the time. The world is fantastic. Okay, if you look at the antenna of, these grass, of this grasshopper, they're very short. Look at the antenna of this, which are very long, this is a katydid. And the easiest way to tell a grasshopper from a katydid is the length of its antenna. This is a really easy thing to talk to people about so that they, when they go out to nature, uh, they can tell the difference between a grasshopper and katydid just by looking. There are lots of katydid species. They all have very long antennas. Some of them, when they're little nymphs like this one, have antenna that are so long, I don't understand how they move around the world. But they're really pretty. Some of them are very well camouflaged. One of the other fascinating things about katydids, among many things, is that they hear through their elbows. Mm -hmm. So their front elbows have these little holes right there where that arrow is pointing. That's where that's their hearing organ. That's their ear, basically. And grasshoppers and katydids both are incredibly important food sources for things like birds and small mammals that eat insects during the summer. Okay, so those are a whole bunch of stories. I'm just throwing a bunch of stories at you as examples of things that are fascinating about nature, that are really wonderful about nature, 
everyone in the room, everyone listening to this will have your own stories of things that you find really fascinating or interesting or that drive your passion about nature, right? Those are the stories you should tell. And you can tell them to any audience. You can tell people on Facebook. You can tell people at the bowling alley. You can talk to people on the bus. You can tell your relatives. It doesn't matter who you tell. Tell it in an appropriate way. Use your passion and people will listen to you and they'll be engaged. And that's how we're going to grow conservation. I'm going to end with one last story about my absolute favorite insect in the whole world. And my favorite insect in the world is called the camouflaged looper. And a looper is another name for an inchworm. And the camouflaged looper feeds on flowers. And as it does so, it takes pieces of those flowers and glues them to its back as camouflage. That's where the name comes from. So in this picture, those little purple things on the back of that caterpillar are not part of the caterpillar. Those are parts of purple prairie clover, which is the flower that it's been feeding on for a while. As those little bits of flower dry up over time, it'll take them off and replace them with fresh ones to keep its camouflage looking good. And then when it switches to a different kind of flower, it changes its costume to match the new kind of flower. It's an incredible little insect. As an adult, it looks like this. It's, it's called the wavy lined emerald moth, which is fine. It's a very pretty little moth, but it's really the caterpillar that I find most interesting. And I wanna end with this little, this little uh, quick story. So I was up here at the Niagara Valley Preserve where I'm at now, a couple of summers ago, and I found this little camouflage looper feeding on a sunflower. So I'm returning all the way back to the beginning, talking about sunflowers and all the resources they provide. This camouflage looper was feeding on the sunflower and you can see little pieces of sunflower stuck on its back because that's what it does. Uh, if you didn't think it was cute already, here it is eating part of a sunflower uh, like an ice cream cone, holding it in its little, little feet up front. So I took some pictures of this caterpillar and then I thought, you know, I need to show this to some other people. And there were people at the headquarters that they were gonna be back the next day, it was, it was in the evening. I grabbed the flower and the, and the caterpillar on it and I took it in my truck back to headquarters and I wanted to show it to everybody the next day. So I put, it, put the flower in a jar with some water, put another kind of flower in there thinking maybe it would change its costume overnight, which would be fun. And then I put underneath it, I put a piece of paper towel across the top of the jar just to keep it from falling into the water, right? I didn't want it to drown. That would be a sad end in the story. And then I put a glass over the top of all of that to make a little terrarium, basically. So it looked kind of like this. I went to bed with this on the dining room table of the, of the uh, cabin I was staying in up here. And the next morning I got up and the first thing I did was I went to check uh, to see what the caterpillar had done. I was really hoping it had changed its costume, right? Because that'd be a fun story. And I was right. It had changed its costume, which was amazing but it didn't change its costume the way I expected. It didn't change from the yellow flower to the purple. This is how it changed its costume. <laughs> Which is of course what it should do, right? It matched the dominant color in the landscape and it pick, picked up pieces of paper towel that glued it to a back and it camouflaged itself against that paper towel. And if I didn't already love this insect more than anything else in the world, I did now. So that's all I have. Um, Again, my big message is remember that nature depends on people. We don't have a way to get out of that obligation now. Um, we've been doing it so long that the world is adapted to humans. We have an obligation to do our job well now and to manage nature and conservation around us. And we need as many people to be supporting that as we can or we're not gonna make it work. So share your passion, tell your stories and thanks for uh, your attention tonight. Thank you, Chris. That was an amazing presentation. Um, yes, I loved all the stories. I'm really glad that you that you included that. Um, so this and other virtual presentations that uh, Wild Ones hosts uh, are recorded. You can find them on our YouTube. So if you want to revisit this or, or look at any all, any of the other talks that we've had uh, recorded in the past, you can you can go to our YouTube. Um, in addition to Chris, I want to thank the whole team uh, that helped put this together. So um, the Nature Conservancy for connecting us with Chris and really Brittany, um, who's doing an amazing job this week and all of them, but this week is a lot. Uh, 
all the all the people from Wild Ones who helped with the, the technical aspects of the, the presentation and, and organizing that part. Uh, Metro Park Salido for hosting us at this venue and then for leading us on a walk. And um, all of you, all the audience who joined in person and online, we're really glad that, that you joined us for this um, and, and that you're here tonight. So uh, don't forget the plant sale this Saturday and Sunday at the Blue Creek Seed Nursery. Um, Saturday, 10 to 12 is the Wild Ones members pre-sale. And then um, public sale is 12 to four on Saturday and 10 to two on Sunday. Um, so thank you everyone online. Chris, thanks again. Um, and everyone who joined us online. Hope you have a good night. Oh my gosh. Should we do questions? I think we should do questions. I scrolled past that in my little thing. Sorry about that. Um, questions. Do we have questions online? Okay. Not yet. Sorry, Chris, you thought you were going to get to log out. Oh, um, no problem. Any questions in person? Did anyone write down a question? Or Looks like we have one on the online right now. Peter wants to ask a question. Chris, hey, thank you. You. just reading that? No, I'm here. Peter raised his hand. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's an honor to have you speak during our Blue Week uh, for the Oak Openings region. We really appreciate it. Um, so I think uh, if you were here, you'd probably find out that the message of management is uh, and, and stewardship is pretty well received in the Oak Openings, where there's lots of people who are, who are already on board that we need to burn and mow and deal with invasives and in whatever way we can. So, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. But uh, I've been thinking a lot, and I, I work for TNC, so, you know, I do this professionally, and I've been thinking a lot about the trade-offs between management and uh, and the mortality of, um, of some of these insects. So we know that some, many insects overwinter on plant material. We also know that in order to keep that the uh, the uh, ball in the bowl and keep the uh, the habitat that we want, we need to do management. So where we work, uh, a lot of times it comes down to mowing and fire, and there seems to be an an impossible way. There seems to be no way to avoid the trade off of when you apply mowing and fire, you are going to have some mortality. And one way to deal with that would be to do about a third to a half of your of your area and keep a refuge at a third to a half on the other area. And my question is, is there are there other ways to avoid this uh, seemingly impossible trade-off mm -hmm. of management and wildlife mortality? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a really important question. And there's not a single, there's there's not just one single answer to that. I mean, the best answer I think is what you said, which is making sure that when you have a small fragment of a habitat surrounded by things that are not habitat, if it's isolated, you really wanna be careful not to burn or, or mow the whole thing at the same time, right? Because then there's nothing, I mean, anything that's vulnerable to that disturbance is gonna be gone. And you can pretty quickly lose an entire species from that site. And if it's isolated enough, there's not an easy way for it to come back. So it might be a permanent loss. So that's a real risk. So leaving refuges is important. Sometimes that's really hard though, right? I mean, if you have a small area already and you're trying to burn it, burning every few years might not be enough to keep woody encroachment out. Um, or it might be really logistically difficult to burn part of a very small site because there's not an easy way to split it. And that gives you a real challenge that again, there's not really an answer to necessarily, other than I think it's important to think about what you want to get from that site that and what, what a reasonable set of objectives is. And sometimes the answer to that might be, look, the most critical threat to this whole ecosystem is woody encroachment, for example. And so burning and mowing 
is the way we keep that woody encroachment from taking out and squeezing out whatever little grassland is left here. If we don't do that, we lose everything. And so we might have to give, have that trade-off of we may lose some of our invertebrate species to save everything else. And that's a really uncomfortable choice to make, but sometimes it could be the right choice or it could be the best choice that we know at this point. Um, and I, I, there's no way for me to be critical of someone who makes that choice as long as they're making it thoughtfully, right? And I think that's the key is to recognize exactly what you said, that there are these trade-offs. The thing to remember is if you have that, the real answer to that conundrum is not is habitat restoration to make an area bigger. Because the bigger that area is, the less vulnerable you're going to be to local extinctions of species because you're doing things like mowing or, or burning, right? If you have a large area with a lot of redundancy in the habitats that are provided, that risk goes way down. So whenever we can, the best example or the best strategy for that is to make those areas large and connected to increase the resilience in that way so that we have an easier time managing. That's not always possible, which is why we end up with these really difficult choices. And then again, you just do the best thing you can. Um, and I think you just have to make a choice and move on and then try to learn as much as you can and adapt over time as, as you can. But again, la and the last thing I'll say about that is, remember that the disturbances that we're doing today are often at a much smaller scale than those disturbances would have happened historically. So you might've had huge swaths of the landscape that would burn at the same time. And it would have huge mortality impacts across that big swath of fire, for example. And those species would recover, but of course the landscape context was different and allowed those species to sort of recolonize. We, we can do that same thing at, the, at a different scale today than we did historically, but it's really hard to know how well that translates. But in general, these systems are, are adapted to that kind of disturbance, even a, a pretty extreme disturbance that can kill some species. So you do the best you can, you leave refugees and you make hard choices. And I don't know that there's a better answer than that, unfortunately. No, that's great. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Sure. Keep trying to read this. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. So we have one in the audience here in person. Have you had to change any management strategies to specifically promote resilience in the face of climate change? Yes, absolutely. Um, a great example is what we just talked about with woody encroachment. As we get more atmospheric CO2 and in our area, increasing frequency of droughts, both of those things are pushing deciduous shrubs to become more assertive <laughs> within the communities. Uh, and they're spreading faster and faster than they have been ever before. And so we're having these really difficult choices of we don't think we can burn often enough in our landscape to control those shrubs just with fire. Um, we use a lot of grazing where I'm at as, as a conservation tool and fire plus grazing can help with some of those things. But even fire plus grazing is not slowing that sort of invasion of, of native mostly shrubs into our grasslands. And so this summer actually, we're starting a new research project where we're gonna try, we have a whole sheet, a whole list of different ideas we have about how to push those shrubs back because we know how to kill them. Like we can spray 2,4-D on, on smooth sumac, for example, and it'll die. The problem is if we do that at the scale that we're working here, I'm at, I'm at the Niobrara Valley Preserve again, we have patches of smooth sumac here that are 100 acres or 200 acres in size. If we broadcast herbicide across that 200 acres, we lose all the plant diversity underneath the sumac when we kill the sumac. And then what have we really gained? So we are struggling right now to come up with solutions to dealing with that invasion at a large scale. And I don't have all the answers to that, but it's clearly something we need to do differently than what we've been doing for a long time because the conditions have changed and the species are acting differently. Um, I would say apart from that, there are some other examples. A lot of them though are similar in that we're still learning. We're still trying to figure out what's